And um, really, so I'm just going to try uh, to talk about uh, the general aspects of twisted bilagraphene and why we find the system very exciting. Uh, and really, this is just a rough outline. So I'll just try to give a broader introduction to um, uh, graphene and Mori materials and so on, and what you can do um, with it to prepare quantum states. And then I'll really just, uh, just as an overview, I will go uh, through all of the quantum many body phases that we observe and explain what we uh, find interesting uh, in the system. And so, and as Uli just mentioned, so we just moved to Munich. So um, uh, this uh, is our first group picture taken last week. So we're more or less uh, getting in our final shape. So we're already fabricating actually uh, at the department. Uh, and a lot of actually uh, students and postdocs came, came along with us from Barcelona. So I think we're more or less uh, operational in a month or two. Uh, and we're also ready to take uh, students and so on. So if you know anybody who's interested in this, we'll be happy to uh, talk to these people. And of course, also we are uh, probably the newest member of SENSE and MCQST. Uh, and I also want to um, uh, particularly point out some of the theory collaborators we, which we had over the years who supported our experimental studies, in particular, Alan McDonald, Ander Bernovic, Leonard Levitov, uh, and, and many more. Uh, and so really um, jumping right into it. So basically, uh, twisted bilagraphene uh, was discovered basically in 2018 when Pablo Carlo Carrero from MIT showed that when you take two graphene sheets uh, together, you align them with a specific twist angle uh, one, with one another, and you create the so-called Moray potential, which is just an interference pattern between the crystallographic axes here, uh, you really uh, find a lot of uh, novel uh, and exciting quantum phases, in particular, uh, superconductivity, which uh, people believe to be unconventional, uh, correlated insulators, strange metal behavior, and also the system shows magnetism and non-trivial topological behavior. So in principle, in a nutshell, I think we believe that this is really a rich platform which shows a lot of um, the sort of uh, state-of-the-art uh, aspects of modern condensed matter physics. And also, um, really, um, the platform itself is also quite unusual, so I think nobody um, um, uh, used the sort of Murray superpotentials uh, before to create and uh, prepare these quantum phases. And I really want to contrast the system with other material species that people have uh, come up with over the years that show a, sort of a similar zoo of um, many body ground states. And of course, those are crystals. So most famously, cooperates, high temperature superconductors, nictides, um, heavy fermion systems, and so on. They showed uh, um, um, hand wavy very similar phases, so also a magnetism and superconductivity in particular. Uh, but here the length scales are completely different. So in crystals, um, um, lattice uh, constants are in the orders of angstroms, and therefore also the uh, sort of electrons sit close by to each other, and uh, the interaction energies, Coulomb interaction energies, are kind of uh, large and in the orders of EV. And this is really different in this system because this. Uh, Moray superpotential uh, is a, has lattice constants, which is almost two orders of magnitude bigger. It's in the orders of 10 nanometers, and therefore also the interaction energies are completely different, uh, much smaller actually. Uh, and the other sort of uh, systems platform you can compare uh, these materials to is, of course, optical lattices. As you know, also superfluidity. Uh, MOT insulators were famously shown actually here in Munich. Um, uh, and really, uh, this is also a, a different platform here. Um, and we really, compared to this system, we actually have a smaller lattice constants and actually higher interaction energies. So, but in overall, really, I think this is uh, occupying a sweet spot here between these two more traditional systems. Uh, and really, um, uh, I wanna uh, take a really um, long tour to actually explain how do we prepare these materials and then also how uh, to explain these phases. And I really wanna start really basic uh, with a sort of, um, uh, basically in 2004, uh, under game, uh, Costa Novoselov, who got the Nobel Prize later on for the discovery of graphene, they have shown that with a simple scotch tape trick, you can prepare basically uh, many, many uh, different species of two-dimensional materials, starting from um, three-dimensional Van der Waals materials. So Van der Waals materials are layered materials where um, uh, um, atoms are arranged in, in planes, and only then you can stack these materials up to one another to get three-dimensional crystals. And really uh, what they showed back in the day that probably all of these van der Waals materials, you can exfoliate down to the single layer limit and really study these um, uh, condensed matter platforms in the two-dimensional limit. And really uh, this opens up entirely new possibilities to study sort of uh, all the different uh, families of um, materials like superconductors, magnets, uh, semiconductors, of course, and so on in this uh, two-dimensional limit. 
And really, uh, just uh, by itself, of course, uh, studying materials in the two-dimensional limit, people have done this for many years. This is sort of an interesting direction by itself. So really contrasting um, um, our systems, for example, with um, systems like um, uh, grown uh, heterostructures and so on. Uh, so our uh, crystals are usually uh, true single crystals. So you can see it here. Um, this is like a typical image of uh, MOS2. So this is a uh, semiconducting material. So usually when we prepare these materials, they're already single crystals. They usually have an ex extremely high um, crystal graphic uh, quality just to begin with. Um, and uh, really quantum confinement in the Z direction uh, renormalizes uh, the uh, condensed matter effects that you can observe in the system. Then the other thing is that layer control. So is um, really important in these systems. So uh, different um, thicknesses of materials, whether you have one single layer or two, single, two layers, three layers and so on, it's, it has a distinct um, um, uh, band structure. So it's basically a distinct condensed matter system by itself. Uh, and very often uh, these materials also have different symmetries. So for example, if we take two layers of MOS2, it has uh, inversion symmetry, whereas one layer of MOS2 does not have inversion symmetry. And this uh, can change the, its properties quite dramatically. So for example, single layer MOS2 is a direct uh, band gap semiconductor, where, whereas many um, multi-layers, they don't have a direct band gap. Uh, and uh, third, of, third uh, of course, uh, these materials can have a strong, uh, enhanced electronic interactions because they're again, not surrounded by 3D bulk, uh, but they're really surrounded. Um, they're really um, just purely two dimensional dielectric screening might be very different and uh, really uh, electronic interactions can be enhanced. And of course, because we have two dimensional materials, electric and magnetic fields can penetrate it easily. So magnetic fields that we apply to the system uh, can of course quantize um, uh, the electrons at the London levels and people have um, observed a rich quantum hole and Hofstadter butterfly uh, effects in the system. And of course you can also apply electric fields to control the carrier concentration in these materials. Something which um, in 3D crystals, it's hard to do because then you need to dope and uh, uh, introduce uh, impurities and so on. And you uh, don't have uh, that tuning knob there. And so uh, the other thing which was originally interesting about the systems is that people have also very quickly discovered that you can actually stack these materials with a very simple, similar scotch tape trick. And you can just really go ahead and you can take different two dimensional species. So you can just stack them one on top of another and you can create these so-called Van der Waals heterostructures. And you can really precisely control the sequence of materials that you want to assemble. So you can just take magnets, superconductors, uh, topological materials and you can just assemble them in these sandwiches and, and basically combine the um, uh, material species that you like and hybridize them um, uh, in the system. And of course, looking at this uh, scotch tape trick, uh, many people in the beginning, me included, we thought, okay, this is, this is not gonna give you anything high quality. So of course you can take anything and combine it, but does anything serious come out of this? Uh, and it turned out uh, surprisingly to everybody that indeed uh, it does. And this is for example, uh, showing, uh, highlighting a little bit the quality of these uh, Van der Waals heterostructures. So this is really a, a TM cross-section between HBN, graphene, and MOS2. If you look at the interfaces, the interfaces are extremely clean. So you can get really um, uh, uh, regions where a hybridization between the materials is uh, perfect on a nanometer scale. Uh, and really you can find large areas where the interface properties are kind of um, uh, extremely good. Uh, and the third trick, of course, that um, these materials make so interesting, and this will be basically the, the main uh, part of my talk, is of course that you can create these Moray super lattices. And this is really uh, just given by the fact that you can uh, um, create, uh, you can start with two dimensional materials and you can define any given crystallographic orientation between the two crystals to create this interference pattern. And really, I want to highlight uh, really this uh, particular. Um, uh, capability uh, with um, sort of more traditional um, techniques that has been, been developed over the years. So for example, very famously, of course, over like many decades, people have grown uh, molecular beam epictasy techniques to create heterostructures. So they, they were able to do a lot of these things where uh, they were able to grow just different material species one on top of another and create um, heterostructures. For, for example, gallium arsenide, of course, one of the uh, most famous systems uh, to cre be created in this way. But molecular beam epitaxy really uh, works on the principle that in, a, in an ultra high vacuum chamber, you sprinkle very controlled atom by atom on, on, um, on a given um, uh, uh, pattern substrate. 
And because you start with individual atoms, when these atoms land on the surface, they of course align each itself with the pattern substrate. So whenever you grow these layers, as you can see, so all the crystallographic excesses are interlocked into one another, and you cannot rotate uh, these uh, structures. And this is really different here with um, Van der Waals materials because we don't start with single atoms, but we start with um, two-dimensional planes. We can, uh, they're robust enough and we can basically align them with any given orientation that we like. And we can really control the twist angle between the different layers with um, uh, 0.1 um, uh, degree precision. So it's really a precise process uh, that we can apply and we can really create these artificial uh, moray superpotentials. Uh, and just really before, um, uh, to highlight to you how this uh, all, all of this physics unfolds here. So usually we start again with just a simple uh, graphene sheet. So this is really this hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms uh, in this two-dimensional configuration. If you uh, look at the time binding um, uh, properties of this material, then it's, it's relatively simple. So we have uh, two atoms in a unit cell, A and B. Uh, they're basically equivalent um, carbon atoms. We have a hopping parameter and plane between the two lattice sites, uh, gamma zero. And if we do now the low temperature, um, low energy expansion in the time binding model, we just get these Dirac cones. So basically in graphene, electrons behave like massless particles. So basically this is the same sort of uh, um, band structure, uh, energy dispersion that you get from Dirac materials. And therefore um, uh, graphene is called a Dirac material. Uh, and uh, what I also want to say is that there are two of these uh, billion zones, uh, uh, two of these uh, Dirac cones uh, in this hexagonal brilliant zone, and they sit at this K uh, and K prime uh, values. And really, um, in, in, in graphene, in addition to a spin degeneracy of two, we also have valley degeneracy of two. So these valleys uh, really um, uh, make the system more degenerate, and they're uh, used for many valleytronic applications, for example. So, okay, so moving on. So this is single layer. So the other system which often uh, uh, is studied is also just AB stacked uh, bilayer graphene. So those are really just two graphene sheets stacked uh, one on top of another with the same crystallographic orientation and the sort of uh, energy favored uh, this, um, uh, uh, alignment of these is AB. And this is basically looking like that. So where one carbon uh, lattice is basically si sitting on top of the other, but shifted slightly that the atoms are not exactly one on top of another, but one of the top atoms is sitting in the center of the hexagon on the bottom one. And of course, if we do time binding of that system now, so first of all, we have more electrons per unit, um, more atoms per unit cell. We have now four. That's why we have four bands now. Uh, we also have extra um, uh, tunneling terms. So gamma one, gamma three, gamma four. Those are basically the tunneling terms between the lattice. Uh, and overall, if you do the tight binding calculation, you get with a renormalized band structure, which is now hyperbolic almost parabolic in uh, close to zero energy, but then at higher energy, it becomes again linear. So, um, but I think what, what I want to um, highlight with this is that really the band structure becomes strongly renormalized. If you add the second layer and these extra hop, uh, hopping terms really renormalize the band structure. And of course, what we do uh, now with fisted bilayer graphene, we mess, mess this whole picture up completely uh, by rotating our graphene sheets on top of one another. And you can see that this uh, Moray uh, superpotential is created. A and for the uh, angle of interest that I will explain in a second for this magic angle where all the uh, interesting things happen, uh, we have a, a de uh, um, twist degree of 1.1 degrees. The lattice constant is 14 nanometers. And if you now count up the, electron, uh, the um, um, atoms per Moray unit cell, you, you, you find something like 10,000 10 or 12,000 carbon uh, atoms in one unit cell. So it's a huge unit cell now. And I think for theorists that in the beginning, it was challenging to calculate um, with, with such a big amount of um, um, atoms in the unit cell. Um, and really this is uh, um, what gives rise to this whole uh, renormalization. So now the sort of interlayer tunneling terms, of course, are a function of uh, this periodic potential and they vary in space. Uh, and this really uh, can lead to strong renormalization effects and really most famous, um, and I will talk about this in a second, but I also want, before I do that, I also want to show you just some structural properties. So really this is, uh, for example, um, uh, immediately something which you can understand is that this is STM topography imaging. So really this is just measuring the height profile of su such created Moray superpotential. 
Um, you might confuse it with really atoms being imaged by STM, but if you look at the length scales here, it's 250 nanometers. So this is really what we're imaging here is really this moray superpotential. Uh, and what you uh, immediately also see is that these moray superpotentials can be quite homogeneous and long range. So really over microns area sizes, you can prepare these artificial uh, super lattices. And so the other thing which I immediately also show, uh, explained to you before is that the band structure becomes renormalized. And this is, uh, for example, um, theory calculations for the band structure of, for a twist angle of 1.3 degrees. So you can see, instead of this smooth hyperbolic band structure, there are really band gaps being formed. They're like uh, flat band regions being formed and so on. So the band structure becomes renormalized and it also the Fermi surface becomes uh, rather complicated. And really um, uh, for this 1.1 uh, uh, twist angle uh, device, you get these flat band regions, which in a second, I'll explain why these are so interesting. And really this is also something just um, immediately to explain, this is something you can measure with ARPES, with angle result for the emission spectroscopy. You can map out these uh, band structures and you can really find a good agreement between what's theoretically predicted on a single particle level uh, and what the band structure um, really looks like in these systems. So, okay, uh, and uh, really just uh, to uh, slowly start wrapping up the introduction. So really what we're dealing with in the end, if we prepare a twisted bilagraphene with 1.1 degrees, we're dealing with a band structure like this. So this is also including some strain and so on, which people came up with uh, to explain it in more detail. And so really we end up with uh, flat bands close to zero energy uh, with a bandwidth of around 10 MeV. Uh, and these bands are separated to higher, higher order bands by larger band gaps. So those are isolated flat bands. And of course, what happens in a system like that is that if the band is extremely flat, the kinetic energy of the systems becomes um, very small. So basically um, we can almost treat that system in a, uh, a zero kinetic energy limit. So electrons become very slow. And therefore, if you now um, look um, at the Hamiltonian, if you write down the um, uh, the Hamiltonian of the system, then you will find that the interaction energies become much bigger than the kinetic energies. And therefore, really uh, a lot of these uh, phases like uh, Mott insulator and so on uh, uh, are given in the system where the electrons strongly interact between one another, but they're relatively slow uh, and maybe localized even um, on the lattice. Uh, and another thing which I will uh, just briefly mention is that of course, um, uh, people who do top topology uh, of materials, they also can analyze the single particle band structure just from, um, they can analyze the barrier curvature, the helicity uh, of the, and the winding numbers in the system. And what they find is that really these billion zones that are newly created, these moray brilliant zones, mini, mini billion zones, uh, they really have uh, different um, topological uh, properties than uh, graphene, a single layer graphene. And really um, uh, the, um, uh, basically um, these uh, flat bands are also topological in nature. And basically you cannot find uh, localized Vanya functions, but you have to really think in, in, order, in, in terms of churn bands where electrons basically are uh, delocalized in, um, in, the, um, in the material. So, okay, so um, um, now uh, really um, um, having established this, just really wanna throw, in, oh, um, wanna explain um, also some differences uh, that these systems have in uh, comparison to traditional um, uh, systems like, again, the cuprates, like the crystal crystalline systems or optical lattice systems is that actually we have uh, novel tuning knobs to study these systems. So just really looking here at uh, the uh, MOT uh, um, um, or the Hubbard, uh, Hubbard uh, model, uh, basically um, what um, um, can describe basically tr electronic transport in a system uh, like that is of course uh, given just by two parameters, which is T. This is sort of the hopping parameter between the two lattice sites, right? So electrons can hop from one lattice site, oh, from one lattice site to the other. And this is defined by the kinetic energy T. Uh, and then of course, uh, if you have an occupancy of uh, two electrons per unit cell, let's say, of course, this costs you some uh, Coulomb energy because the electrons come very close to one another. And this is basically the on-site Coulomb uh, energy U or, or in other words, this is sort of the interaction energy uh, for the electrons. Uh, and as I mentioned before, so here uh, in a system like that, T is very small, U is very large. Uh, uh, and therefore, of course, electrons um, like to um, localize on their given lattice sizes and, and forms a so-called Mott insulator. 
Uh, but really what I want to show in this slide is that we can actually different than what's, what you can do in, in crystals, we can actually control both of those parameters relatively freely. So we can control both U and T, uh, and we have really control knobs uh, to change these properties. And this is uh, seen here. So this is um, uh, basically calculation of density of states as a function of, of twist angle. Uh, and where the two sort of um, one hover singularities uh, uh, on the band edges come together, this is really where the bands become very flat. And this is really happening. Uh, this is really complicated. Uh, this is really happening on this um, in this red uh, spot here. This is where the bands are the flattest, and this is where we hit exactly the magic angle, 1.1 degrees. As you can see, so if you move a little bit away from this magic angle, uh, the bandwidth increases again. So basically, just by controlling the twist angle, we control t. Uh, with any precision that, that we want. Uh, and of course, uh, the other thing is that we can control is U. And U is really, the control of U is really given by the dielectric environment of the material. So again, as I mentioned before, right, we uh, have these heterostructures where twisted bilegraphene is encapsulated in different material species. And for example, this HBN, this is an insulator, this is hexagonal boron nitride. This has a specific dielectric constant. Of course, we can take another um, material with a different dielectric constant, and therefore the effect of uh, Coulomb interaction changes um, uh, by choice of, of the substrate. And the other thing is, because it's again, uh, the distances here are so small, really the sub nanometer distances between the uh, different layers, we can also bring a metallic layer very close by. So in this particular case, for example, graphite, which in, for all purposes is just a metal, you can bring it very close to the twisted bilegraphene. And that metal starts screening the electronic interactions there. So also you, by, ch by, by choice of the, the environment, um, can be varied. So this is really new. So I think um, doing that in um, crystals is very hard. In optical lattices, probably too. So here, really, we have um, uh, novel control knobs uh, to tune these systems. Uh, and the other thing, really, uh, what's, what's extremely useful, what you don't have access to in crystals, is that we can just control the Fermi energy continuously with any precision that you want. Uh, and this is really done by this electrostatic gates. So again, this graphite gate that I showed you just before, you can apply voltage to it. And as a capacitor, you can charge or discharge your twisted bilegraphene. And you can uh, sort of the levels of control that we have is we can completely empty the band and we can completely fill the band and we can, in, with any precision, we can sweep through that band uh, and control the Fermi energy. And this is really, makes experiments clean, reproducible. We can really, in one single device, take all the phase diagrams uh, continuously, uh, which otherwise in crystals would take you really, um, would, you would need to grow hundreds of different specimens of different doping concentrations. Then you would have to worry about whether the doping concentration actually induces some disorder that changes the properties by, by the material. Okay, so and really just show you now, uh, really moving on to the measurements that we do um, uh, and to show you the richness of the phase diagram, really uh, what uh, you can see here are measurements on, on, on a specific device that we made, which shows all the phases in one single device. Again, um, uh, measured um, um, uh, simultaneously. So what we measure here is really just resistance. So we just uh, take a device, we measure four terminal resistance uh, and of course, what we also do is we can control the gate. So we can control with the gate, the carrier concentration. So we can charge and discharge again across the entire band. Uh, and we also, what we do is we can translate this carrier density into a something which we call a filling factor. And filling factor is nothing else but counting the electrons per unit cell. So basically we, we can fill one electron per unit cell two electrons per unit cell, three electrons per unit cell. And then at four electrons of, uh, of the unit cell, of course, the band is full because again, we have this spin valley degeneracy, but we can really look um, uh, with any control we like, we can, we can uh, look um, and fill, uh, fill, fill this, the lattice here. Uh, and what you can see here is really uh, the following. So if I now look that high resistance is red regions, blue is uh, very low resistance. So you can see when we measure the devices, the uh, resistance changes orders of magnitude. And in particular, we see red regions most of the time when we fill one, two or three electrons per unit cell. So really there is already like some dependency that we form rather insulating states uh, at these integer positions. And really uh, I will in more detail talk about these states, but really these states 
are the correlated insulators. In other words, those are mod, mod insulators, if you like. So, so, so um, the, 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 the bottom N, this is the carry density without definition. This is just electrons per centimeter squared, right? Uh, and, right, exactly. And the filling factor, this is per moray, electrons per moray unit cell. Yeah. Uh, and this is, by the way, this is very low carry density. If you look at this is 10 to the 12. So basically this is a very low uh, carry density. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll talk in, in, in more detail about it. So, okay, so these red regions at uh, integer filling, those are the correlated insulators. What we also see, if you dope, again, you apply a gate and you just go a little bit away from this correlated insulator here, and then resistance goes from an insulating to a superconducting state with a TC, with a critical temperature of around 3.5 Kelvin in this case. Uh, and really the resistance just drops to zero. Uh, and of course, we can also apply magnetic fields to kill the superconductivity with uh, HC2 of around uh, 100, 100 millitesla. So, uh, and the, the interesting thing is really these superconductors, they sit very close by to the mod insulating states. So they, they usually attract each other. So this is also something interesting to think about whether these states are related or not. And this is of course a big debate right now. Uh, then again, applying a gate, moving to a completely different filling. So here at filling factor one, we observe magnetism. And really the magnetism, how do we measure it? We measure Hall effect, right? We measure RXY. So this is the, uh, in uh, sort of the perpendicular resistance uh, to the current of flow. And when we basically sweep the magnetic field up or down, we observe these hysteresis loops and these hysteresis loops are typically like experimental evidence for um, magnetism. And really, uh, I will show more, more about this uh, later on. And also what I wanna already pay attention to is that really, if you look at the whole resistance, uh, it's really almost quantized to H over E squared. And some groups actually have observed uh, quantization of the states of H over E squared. So not only is this magnetism, but it also immediately some topology built into, into that. And this is, uh, so, so uh, you can really observe quantum Hall effects at a zero field uh, in the system. And so this is this sort of um, magnetism also immediately translates into uh, some um, uh, churn insulating states. So in other words, this magnetism we can explain by zero field churn insulators. And really um, we can have a better view on these churn insulators that appear in the system by applying uh, a perpendicular magnetic field breaking time reversal symmetry. And we can really see a rich sequence of churn insulators which are basically again uh, pointing out uh, what I said before is that the nature of the bands is topological by on a single particle level already. And last but not least, um, in the center of the bands, we observe uh, strange metal behavior where really the metallic state itself without any other uh, phase transition that is going on nearby also behaves as a non-fermi liquid like um, metal. And we uh, believe that this is a strange metal similar to what uh, people have observed in uh, um, strongly correlated systems like the cuprates, for example. And so really, um, I will just uh, spend some time to go through each phase a little bit in more detail. Uh, Ian, do you, know, do you know how much time do I have? So half, uh, so 15 minutes, right? Something like that? Okay. All right, so, and, and really, um, so really just, just to give a um, few words about each of those phases. So really transport measurements uh, on correlated insulators, as I mentioned, we just measure resistance as a function of carrier density, or in other words, uh, electron filling um, here on the top. And really you can see um, that the resistance jumps orders of magnitude whenever it's one, two, three, or four electrons per unit cell. Uh, and um, uh, really in a single particle picture from the band structure, we would not expect any insulating states to be here, but the whole band supposedly should be uh, just metallic. Uh, and really the way we sort of understand the system is again, uh, thinking of a mod insulator. So again, uh, we can uh, think of uh, electrons on a lattice. Uh, we can think of uh, kinetic energy T to jump to the nearest neighbor sites, but we can also understand that once two electrons are at the same lattice site, it costs a lot of energy uh, to do that. So if you have this mod uh, insulator condition, so if um, onset energy is much, much bigger uh, than the kinetic energy, then electrons just like to localize on the unit cell. And uh, what, what happens is that something which, uh, some band which uh, traditionally would be just giving you a metal 
uh, is uh, polarized, uh, a band gap is opened, or not band gap, an energy gap is opened. This is um, um, the interaction uh, induced uh, energy gap. Uh, and really the system, then uh, the bands are polarized with respect uh, to uh, some of the quantum numbers that we have in the system. And as I mentioned before, right, we have uh, different degrees of freedom here. We have electrons, uh, electron spins. So this gives us spin up and spin down. And also we had these two different values, K and K prime. And so of course, when we open up an energy gap like that, we polarize the band. Uh, and of course, um, you have to break some symmetry here. So you can break, of course, spin, then you get a ferromagnet, you can break valley, then you get a valley ferromagnet. Uh, but of course, in principle, you have to think of this problem in an SU4 state, uh, state of uh, spin and valley. And of course, uh, sort of the ground stage that you get is, of course, some sort of um, um, SU4 uh, state, which is usually a combination of spin and, and, and belly and so on. Uh, and I think there has been recently good progress in the explanation of these uh, ba bands. And um, there have been a number of papers uh, describing uh, the, candid the potential candidate uh, states uh, in these uh, systems. Those are typically inter valley coherent uh, states. So this is really a combination of uh, spin and valley uh, here. But this already gives you some already some intuition that some sort of magnetism is likely possible in the system because, again, breaking either belly or spin gives you immediately some uh, magnetization. Then moving on, so superconductivity. So as I mentioned, so this is the state here close by to um, the correlated insulators. So uh, a number of measurements have really um, um, uh, uh, studied uh, these uh, species, uh, material species, of course. Uh, um, the first tell sign of um, a superconductor is that resistance has to uh, drop to zero below a critical temperature. So typically in this materials, we measure really zero resistance with these critical temperatures around one Kelvin. But in the best case, we've seen five Kelvin, but it varies from uh, device to device. Then of course, in a, a superconductor, what you can do is you can apply a perpendicular magnetic field and kill the superconductivity. And so really we can show that a critical magnetic field of around uh, 100 uh, millitesla can kill uh, the superconductor. And really the extinction uh, as a function of temperature follows the ginzburg landau theory. And, for, and from that, we can also deduce the coherence um, length of around 50 nanometers uh, for the superconductor. So the coherence length is in the order of three um, super, more super, uh, super lattices. So it's, it's a relatively uh, small coherence length um, uh, with regards to that. Of course, we can measure critical current. So again, in a superconductor, if you apply a large enough current, you kill uh, the superconductivity. Uh, and here, critical currents are in the orders of 100, uh, 10 to 100 nanoamps. But of course, the biggest evidence that we have seen so far from for superconductivity is uh, the uh, occurrence of Fraunhofer interference patterns. So in the beginning, uh, we have seen these Fraunhofer interference patterns because of some disorder in the device, which just separates two superconducting regions and forms basically a Josephson junctions in the device. And those Josephson junctions, if you apply a magnetic field, they start the critical current of these Josephson junctions start oscillating in this Fraunhofer interference uh, pattern. Uh, and really, this is, I think, so far the biggest evidence that it's really not just some zero resistance state that we observe, but this is really a, a quantum state with uh, coherent, coherent properties with a microscopic quantum uh, phase. And really, uh, this, uh, with, with this type of data, it's, it's hard to exclude, uh, exclude superconductivity. So really, only superconductivity should show you that. And I will, in a second, I will also show you that we can control uh, these uh, um, um, Fraunhofer patterns with gates and so on. Um, and so uh, really um, the question that arises now in the field is what type of superconductivity is it? Is it just some boring uh, BCS type superconductivity that people have observed over the years in um, normal metals like aluminum, niobium and so on? Or is it maybe some new superconducting mechanism or some unconventional superconducting mechanism that uh, people have observed as strongly correlated systems like for example, the cuprates and so on. And so uh, really, um, um, of course, the analogy that people have drawn uh, to the system comes from the phase diagram of the cuprates. So really the phase diagram of the cuprates has shown uh, that from a mod insulating state upon doping, you can get superconducting domes left and right, basically on the electron and whole side of it. Uh, and of course, um, if we look, if we zoom in into one of, so this is the phase diagram of twisted bilayer on the top, and it, this, this is really complicated with this. Um, so here, if you look at the phase diagram on the top, so really we can, you know, if we zoom in onto one of those um, 
what insulating states, we can basically paint a very similar phase diagram where upon doping from this uh, correlated insulating state, we get these superconnecting domes. So I think hand wavy, just looking at the phenomenology, of course, uh, this kind of makes sense. But I think uh, what also gives us a little bit of an intuition um, that this material is really special is that really we can look at um, the numbers that we know for sure. So what we know is that A, uh, twisted bilagraphene is the thinnest material. So this, this sort of these different uh, data points that show thickness of known superconductor and their carrier density. So graphene is really the thinnest superconductor you can find, but it's also by far the lowest carrier density superconductor. So the numbers of electrons that combine the superconducting state is record low, and this is five orders of magnitude lower than any existing uh, known um, BCS superconductor. So if we compare aluminum, it has something like close to 10 to the 17 electrons per unit cell, and magic and graphene we have uh, 10 to the 11. And we, if we look at the TC versus a Fermi temperature ratio, which is typically the, um, um, described to, um, uh, uh, to explain um, strong coupling superconductors, really TC over TF ratio is also extremely high. Uh, so uh, it's in the orders of 0.1 uh, um, um, ratio. And really sort of the combination of a relatively sizable TC and a super, super low carrier density, this is already pointing to some mechanism that cannot be just um, directly explained by BCS, but uh, of course, this is something which uh, people are thinking of. Um, and what I also want to show you is really how we can control these superconductors, because again, I mentioned it's, it's the lowest carrier density superconductor. We can really just control the carrier density in the superconductor by applying gates. So just by applying electric fields. And so we've made, for example, these devices where we have a split gate on top of the device. So we can really dope uh, the material except one really narrow region in the center of it. And so we can, what we can do is we can fix the material to the superconducting state, and we can uh, then um, uh, really uh, fix the center to a different um, uh, metallic or ferromagnetic state and so on. And really we can induce Josephson junctions and we can control these Josephson junctions just by this electrostatic tricks uh, that we play. Okay, so, and then uh, I really wanna speed up so uh, I'll skip the topological properties maybe a little bit. Uh, and I really wanna come to um, um, the magnetism. So as I mentioned, so the magnetism uh, is uh, something that we observe um, uh, quite robustly in the system. So the current ongoing explanation of the magnetism is that it's orbital magnetism. So this is the first system to, that shows orbital magnetization uh, in contrast to, to ferromagnetism, which is a spin effect. Here in the system, really the magnetism is mostly a orbital effect. So this really comes from the orbital motion of the electrons uh, in the material. And this orbital motion can be explained relatively simple if, if you have valley polarization. So basically one valley um, that I mentioned before is occupied, but the other valley is not occupied. You automatically get uh, these currents and these currents can be really big enough that you can uh, induce this magnetization here. And for example, what we have done uh, is we have uh, looked at uh, this magnetization in detail. So we have collaborated with uh, Weizmann Institute, Eli Zeldov, who can um, really sensitively and spatially resolve uh, image magnetism with skit and tip microscopy. And this is really something you can really see uh, these uh, magnetic signatures. These are these red and uh, blue patches. Uh, and really the magnetization is 10 times stronger than what you would expect from a ferromagnet. So really there is good evidence that uh, this is really orbital effects that uh, can explain it. Okay, skip through um, strange metal phase. So really um, just wanna give a little bit of an outlook. So, okay, so it's been now four years in this field. So to, to me, it feels already like a long time, but of course it's, it's uh, really just uh, in, in, in explaining the system is really just the beginning. So many of these phases, we still don't really have a microscopic um, understanding of. So I think the things that are better understood are the topological and, and uh, orbital magnetic properties, but the exact ground states of the correlated insulators are not yet fully uh, solved. And the question whether superconductivity is conventional or unconventional, I think this will, this will um, uh, make us busy for another uh, couple of years. Uh, usually it takes a lot of time to explain some superconducting state, it looks like, or, or it doesn't, it's not, or, or maybe it's never being explained, so let's see. Uh, and um, really to give you an outlook, so uh, I've concentrated, of course, uh, on twisted bilagraphene. So this is the system we work in our lab the most, but actually there, 
this, this Moore engineering is a universal concept. So you can take any of these uh, Van der Waals materials that I've shown you in the beginning. So again, there's, there are hundreds of them. All of these materials, you can, uh, you can apply uh, this Moore engineering trick. You can apply super potential. You can renormalize the band structure. And then you could hope for uh, interesting things to happen. Also, people have, of course, moved to uh, multi-layer systems. So the same trick works for two layers, but it also works for three, four or five layers. Um, also, also, it works with different material species combined. So for example, you can combine HBN and graphene and also use this super potential. Uh, what was really popular and was, was really successful was the combination of um, uh, semiconductors, TMDs, so like WSE2, MOS2. Uh, so this also um, revealed some um, condo uh, lattice physics and so on. So this was uh, really uh, something which is extremely um, uh, popular right now. And last but think, this is the, my last slide. So last thing I want to mention is that, OK, so I, I think all of what I was talking about was quantum materials, nanoscience, et cetera. So what does it have to do with quantum? Uh, and so the link to quantum is that we actually use these materials to make uh, detectors. So really sensitive quantum detectors, uh, in particular detectors of electromagnetic radiation, such as, for example, a light. So we can, we have shown a num in a number of papers that we have uh, constructed single photon detectors uh, from these uh, materials. Uh, and really, for example, here is a graphene Josephson junction, which is integrated uh, in a gigahertz resonator. And we have shown uh, that these, um, uh, uh, graphene, uh, proximitized graphene junctions can work as a gigahertz single photon detector and can be in principle also used to superconducting circuit applications and so on. And actually, uh, recently we have also shown number resolving single photon detectors in a twisted biography. We have shown BISCO high temperature superconducting of single photon detectors at 20 Kelvin. So in principle, uh, there's really some real applications, I think, that uh, these low, low density superconductors can be used for. And with this, I want to end. Sorry about uh, over, over being over the time a little bit. Thank you very much, Dima, for this wonderful talk. I mean, there would have been much more to be said, but great. But um, OK, there is a question on the other side for the first time. <laughs> Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. I have a question about the Fraunhofer interference patterns. Do we learn anything about the interaction of this correlated state or the screening of the state with respect to the defects from these patterns? Um, not really, I think, no. I think what we, what we can learn from, um, so the first, the, the first thing which we learn from these Fraunhofer interference pattern, if we know the crystallographic orientation of the Joseon junctions, we can maybe learn something about the phase, um, the phase symmetry of the of the superconductor, right? So whether it's a S wave or maybe a D wave uh, nodal superconductor, and so on. So this is some experiments which we are, uh, which are ongoing. Uh, disorder, I think uh, it's it's a very sensitive uh, subject on disorder. So some people, for example, I mean, just um, some people like would like to do disorder controlled experiments to see how this superconducting phase disappears when you introduce more disorder. Maybe an, an S-wave superconductor should be more robust than a D-wave superconductor, things like that. I see one question. I think it's really fascinating to me also, and I'd like to ask a very general question. You mostly show data from particular angles, magic angles. Mm -hmm. If you consider the twist angle as a continuum, mm -hmm. um, what is mm -hmm. kind of the spectrum, what you expect? I mean, there are phases right. coming up and this is like prime numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so actually um, at 30 degree angles, you get a quasi crystal. So some people, I mean, but is it, is it completely understood or is it? Uh, no, no, this is, this is all new. This is, this is new territory. So that means it would be nice to have a device that could actually do it. Yeah, so people, mm -hmm, exactly, exactly. So people are doing this. So some of my colleagues, they try to uh, position these, um, one of the layers on an AFM tip and rotate it mm -hmm. continuously and to really see what's, what's going on. Um, so basically what happens is at zero degrees, it's cold welded to the other layer. So it's, it's cold welded, but then between zero and 30, you can more or less freely uh, change the twist angle. So around two degrees, the two layers start behaving like if they're not coupled at all. So they're completely separated two layers, even though they're of course so close to one another. And, and then 30 degree angles, they become quasi crystals. So people who are, have interest in quasi crystals could potentially also study that system. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. 
Hi, thank you for your very nice talk. It was a very nice talk. I have a technical question about how the band structure in double layer graphene is computed. Uh, oh, I know. There, because I suppose <laughs> when you have 10,000 atoms in a unit cell, this is not yeah. BFT or any first principle. So, um, yeah, so man, I'm like, I'm not a theorist, unfortunately. Um, right, so. Um, Continuum a model by L. McDonald. So if you Google that, um, <laughs> yeah. so you find some paper. I have never done the calculations myself. No, but then I know. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Further questions? Oh, stay right here. Yeah, many thanks and impressive results. So I have a question regarding the superconductivity. So is the coupling mechanism, so the, the exchange particle, is this evident? And how does the dimensionality uh, kind of factor into this game so this is uh, this is not at all understood yet so it's, it's not not even clear if it's phonons or no, exactly so uh, okay so um there may be on the on the archive you'll find uh, 10 papers which really study the superconducting phase at this point um and uh there may be like 10,000 theory papers explaining it and the the width of explanations varies from super boring conventional uh, electron phonon interaction to like some exotic skarmion um, topological um, pairing mechanisms and so on. So I think um, uh, I think most of the people you would talk to, they think it's it's unconventional at this point, but it's uh, nobody knows the mechanism yet. So I think I think the people I talk to, they tend to favor some sort of really spin spin um, induced mechanism, which in which form, I don't know, I, I, I don't know. Mm. I mean, um, I mean, it should definitely play a role in any theory, right? But uh, we cannot make the system three dimensional. So in terms of experiment, we don't, we don't have that control parameter. So actually people have uh, made devices of three, four, five layers of this uh, Moray systems. TC seems to go down. So the hope was TC would go up somehow, the more layers you add, uh, it would go up, but it's actually going down, but it's not clear whether it's intrinsic or maybe uh, each layer introduces more disorder. So this is completely open question. Uh, so thank you, thank, uh, thank you very much. So all those phases, uh, they are mainly uh, static uh, phenomena. Uh, is it clear how robust are they uh, upon light excitation, for example? Yeah, so <laughs> this is why we make actually uh, single photon detectors from this material is because they're very sensitive. Uh, and so basically the, so because we have such a small number of electrons in the system. So again, it's 10 to the 11 electrons per, per centimeter squared. Um, of course, the heat capacity of that electron ensemble is very small, just by, by the scaling of it. And um, if you inject uh, um, photons onto this, this really raises the temperature just by a bolometric effect immediately quite, by quite a lot. So this is, this is what, the main reason why it's, it's a, such a sensitive uh, bolometer single photon detector. Um, and, um, and the other thing I wanna say is that in graphene, optical studies are really uh, not abundant. Um, what is, uh, but what is really uh, being studied in optics quite a lot are these uh, TMDs, these uh, two-dimensional semiconductors. Uh, they're usually studied with optics. People see excitons and so on, Moray excitons, and, um, and they see actually even a richer, um, a richer am amount of these uh, phases. And they're quite robust for the optical studies, yeah. All right. Thank you. There's two further questions behind there. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question uh, about the general properties of these uh, twisted bilayers. Um, so uh, the super lattice is somehow inherits the symmetry of the constituent of the constituent layers. Are there any super lattice geometries that are not accessible in this way, or that they're very hard, um, not only for graphene uh, but for other materials as well? Yeah. So um, I think. Uh, if you take any give, I mean, sorry, if I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering directly a question, but I think um, other more super lattices are possible. So if you, I think if you take two cubic lattices and position them on top of another, you get a one dimensional more superpotential. So you get stripes. Um, then um, 
basically, if you think of different crystal, crystals that you can assemble, you get different uh, sort of Mori, Mori superpotentials. So it doesn't have to be hexagonal, like in the case of twisted bilayer, it can be uh, stripes, so one D super lattices, and, and so on. So many combinations are possible. Um, the what maybe one thing I want to mention is that the reason it works so good of twisted bilayer here is that it's really intrinsically already a semi metal, so we can um, uh, we can uh, hunt for these phases just by controlling a gate. These these material starts at zero carry density basically, right? If you take a good metal, good superconductor, the Fermi energy is already so high up um, and the carry density is intrinsically so high, you cannot actually control um, the Fermi level and uh, hunt for these phases. So even if you might induce some strong renormalization, it has actually, in, in the case of twisted bilayer, it happens at close to zero energy uh, and we have this uh, tunability. So not, not every material would be possible uh, to begin with. Let me perhaps take this as the last. Next one is the last question. To study the effect of phonons, one could change the mass of the carbon atoms. Yeah. C13. Yeah, so exactly. So, so um, I mentioned that uh, we can do, we have, have, have these new novel tuning knobs in the system, which is good. But they, we also, of course, have some disadvantages from being two dimensional. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that in a, in a system like that, we cannot just do the isotope effect that easily. So isotope effect was used in metals, right? To or in cuprates, for example, by um, to show that uh, Tc is changing with the mass of the fermion uh, of the atoms, right? Uh, because the uh, phonon spectrum is renormalized. In this system, we cannot do this easily. So we would need to get C13 graphites from somewhere. I have I have looked in some uh, some nuclear research facilities. Apparently, have something. Um, and, oh, and of connections, I don't know. I'm not so well connected in the nuclear industry yet. But if you have any connections, I'll be um, happy to hear it. But so we would need to get bulk crystal of C13 graphite, then we can do it. But then I have to say also between our devices, TC varies by more than 10% from device to device because it's never the same strain. It's never the same twist angle. So even if we make this uh, devices from, from C13, we would probably not get a conclusive answer. So there are disadvantages in the system too, as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think there would be many, many more questions to ask, but let's leave it at that. And I will. I will thank Adima once again. And. <laughs>